Welcome to Design Domination, where you'll learn to become a better, more business-savvy designer so you can dominate your competition. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Colleen Grotzer, and in this episode of Design Domination, I'm talking about nine in-design accessibility mistakes that designers make. But first, I wanted to tell you that for the month of June, a lot of my content is going to be focused on accessible design. And I have a really big surprise coming soon. So be on the lookout for that and I will announce it when I put it out there. Okay, so let's dive in. I decided to do an episode on this because I do a lot of InDesign file remediation. And that means I'm taking InDesign files from designers and creative agencies and fixing them to be accessible. Now I'm only covering nine mistakes here, but there are a lot of others. And I'm not trying to shame anyone for making these mistakes. I'm just trying to get designers to understand these important points because, unfortunately, most designers think they're creating accessible files when they truly aren't. There are also a ton of misconceptions about document accessibility and all that's involved in the process. So I just want to clear up some of that confusion. Mistake number one is thinking accessibility is the end of the line. A huge misconception that designers have about document accessibility is that it's the last part of the design and layout process. That accessibility is a button that gets pushed at the end of it. I often get, hi Colleen, I need you to make this file accessible. Here's the file with everything approved by the client. Is that a problem? Not for me, but it is for you and your client. Can I still help? Yes, but this is not an efficient process. First off, I often have to modify colors or redo the design to work with the existing color palette. This costs the end client not only more money, but more time. And it doesn't make you look good if you're the one who created these files. Second, I often have to redo, from scratch, many long complex documents, which costs the client, the end client, several times what it would have had the designer designed with accessibility in mind from the beginning. Sometimes clients will ask me why the designer didn't know how to do this in the first place. And I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but I have to explain how the process works too. Integrating accessibility into the process is key. I tell designers to bring me in early on at the design stage so I can review the cover design before they send it to the client and have them approve it. If they want to design some of the pages in the document, like how the table of contents will look, or the first page of every section, then I tell them to go ahead and set that up. And then I'll review that design, and then I'll take their InDesign file and do all the layout based on those designs. That's much more efficient and cost effective than providing a fully done, approved file that I have to fix or redo. Mistake number two is not using InDesign properly. Many designers don't use InDesign properly, which is a huge problem for accessibility because how you set up the file affects how the PDF will be read or not by a screen reader. Much of the time, I get files from designers who've been using InDesign for 20 years. Some of them tell me they think their files are set up pretty well and they don't expect that I'll have to change much. But when I look at their files, it's a completely different story. Just because you've been using InDesign for 20 years or 10 years doesn't mean you've been using it correctly. Years of experience mean nothing in this case. The other day I consulted with a designer who's been using InDesign for a year. She is self-taught and she learned InDesign from the Adobe InDesign book. Let me tell you, her InDesign skills are better than so many other designers who've been doing this a really long time. I was really impressed. The other thing is, if you can get the InDesign skills down really well, then addressing accessibility is so much easier. You'll also save a ton of time in your workflow. I mean, even when we're not creating accessible files, which is very rare, we'll still use the same workflow, sans the accessibility specific stuff. Using the features of the software properly just goes a really long way. One feature I see underutilized in InDesign is the master pages. A lot of designers also don't use master page features properly. 
I once got a 300-page file that had page numbers added manually. I can't even imagine how long that took to do. Why not put one text frame with an automatic page number on a master page? Using InDesign properly also means using the automated table of contents feature to build the table of contents. Honestly, I can't understand why designers do this by hand. <laughs> it leaves so much room for error in case the page count or even a heading changes. You have to remember to manually change something in two places. It's also very time consuming. If you ever have to redo the table of contents, you might as well have taken the time to build it right the first time, which isn't a lot of time at all. <laughs> paragraph styles are a huge issue. Most designers do their darndest to avoid creating paragraph styles. <laughs> I know a lot of them think that they take too long to set up. I know, I know, it slows you down. But no, set your default styles, which you have to do with no documents open then they will always be there when you create a new document from that point on. I actually just did a session on this at Creative Pro Week 2021. With accessibility, you need to use paragraph styles for all of your text. And I mean all of your text. So you can set all the styling that you want on them and then change the styling per document if needed, but at least the styles are already there. My default paragraph styles include some for headings, lists, tables, table of contents, and other things. They also make generating a table of contents the right way much easier. When it comes to tables, a common mistake I see is not converting the top row to a header row. Now, in a few cases, a table may not have a header row, like if you don't have column headers on the table. I know it sounds confusing because the header row contains table cells that are individual column headers. I won't get deep in the weeds with this, but the point is that most tables should have a header row and most designers don't convert it to one. I've also seen tables set up manually. And by that, I mean someone actually painstakingly took the time to draw rules, lines, to make a table instead of creating a table with the built-in feature. That blows my mind. Mistake number three is thinking an accessible InDesign file results in an accessible PDF. This is another misconception. I just had a client ask me to add placeholder text in part of an InDesign file I was remediating. They said they would change that text later on and then just re-export the PDF. Even though they understood I'd be providing an accessible PDF to them, they were under the impression that they could just make edits later in InDesign and just re-export and have an accessible PDF. Not only that, but they've done this with several files I've remediated for them. So that means the files that they provided to the client after I provided the initial accessible PDF were not accessible. Now with accessibility, you can get the bulk of the work done in InDesign, but there is still a lot more to be done in the PDF. Sometimes not that much. Sometimes though, dozens of hours of work, depending on the length of the document and how complex it might be. You simply just don't go and export from InDesign and poof, your file is accessible. That's just not how it works. There are a lot of things that can't be addressed in InDesign, such as using certain HTML tags because not all of them are available in InDesign. Scoping tables, making certain elements like lines used in tables as artifacts, which mean they get ignored by screen readers and then unnesting certain tags, such as the table tag inside a P tag. Mistake number four is using InDesign structure pane for tagging. This is another mistake I see a lot. This is done by well-meaning designers who think that they're making their files accessible. They've used the structure pane in InDesign and that shows tags, which can also be added through the tags panel, which you get to from the utilities and then tags menu option. But you must know that these tags have nothing to do with accessibility. They're for XML. Tagging for accessibility gets done on the export tags. Mistake number five is only considering the visual design. Some designers might think they're making an InDesign file accessible because they've checked for color contrast issues and then addressed them. But addressing color contrast when designing your document is only part of the work. 
there's an underlying technical structure to the file, and that starts in InDesign. The work you do in InDesign creates that structure as well as the reading order that will then appear in the PDF. For a PDF to be accessible, it must have tags. Without tags, screen readers and other assistive devices or software can't read the document. Whatever software you're using, you have to make sure that it allows you to create what's called a tagged PDF. You can do this from InDesign and Quark Express. Unfortunately, Affinity Publisher currently does not offer that option. But you can also create tagged PDFs from Word and PowerPoint. So considering only the visual design and not the file setup means that you're designing only for sighted users, which is only one of many groups of people. That leaves out people with blindness and people with mobility issues who cannot use a mouse, for example. Mistake number six is having insufficient or too much alt text. By insufficient, I mean that the alt text on an infographic, for example, might be infographic showing the number of people with different types of disabilities. Okay, that might be fine, but it might not be. If the information in that infographic isn't conveyed elsewhere, then users of screen readers will not get that information. Sighted users can get that information from seeing the infographic. That is, if that information meets contrast requirements. But all users must have equal access to information. Sometimes there's actually too much alt text. It could be a long paragraph full of data that's hard for anyone to remember. Users of screen readers can't pause the alt text that's being voiced, so they would have to listen repeatedly to get the information. Another mistake is improper reading order. The reading order is important because the way sighted users read a page is not how a screen reader does. You have to do things to ensure that that order is correct. I see all the time where content is out of order, so a screen reader might read something at the bottom of the page, before it reads the text at the top of the page. Or maybe columns get read in the wrong order. The other thing I see too is designers excluding important content from the reading order. That means that they've artifacted important content, which means a screen reader will ignore it. This could be a logo or a sidebar, for example. The reading order must be checked in the PDF, but it should first be addressed in InDesign with the Layers or Articles panel. Mistake number eight is relying on Acrobat's accessibility checker. Oh, so many designers think the coast is clear if their PDF passes the Acrobat accessibility checker. If you're relying on that to check the accessibility of your PDFs, this is going to be a shock to you. Let me tell you, there are so many errors that this checker cannot detect. It can only potentially catch about 25% to 30% of errors. It can also give false positives. I went into some of the limitations of the Acrobat Accessibility Checker in episode 88. You've simply got to do a lot more thorough testing and that can be done with the free PAC3 Checker. It's Windows only though, so if you're a Mac user, you'll need to set up a virtual machine such as with VirtualBox or Bootcamp. And if that's too technical or difficult, just buy and install Parallels. You also need to test the PDF with a screen reader. Speaking of screen readers, that leads me to mistake number nine, which is relying on Acrobat's Read Aloud. A lot of designers will check their PDFs with Acrobat's Read Aloud feature. But Read Aloud should not be used to test a PDF. My buddy Dex Castro is always preaching this one in his PDF Accessibility Facebook group. There are many issues with Read Aloud. It doesn't relate structural or relationship context. It doesn't identify heading or label structure. And it doesn't identify table columns, rows, or headings. You really got to use a screen reader such as NVDA or JAWS. NVDA is free. Both are Windows only. 
So I hope these nine InDesign accessibility mistakes were helpful for you and made you aware of any that you might be making so that you can correct them in future documents. I don't want you to get in hot water if you're creating accessible documents. InDesign file accessibility is not something to just try and hope you'll figure out on your own. It really requires guidance from an expert so that you know that what you're doing is correct. If you're looking for InDesign accessibility training, check out Bevy Chagnon's InDesign and PDF accessibility class at pubcom.com. I took that back in 2016 when I didn't even know what accessibility was. And I always say how much of a game changer accessibility has been for my business. If you've been doing InDesign accessibility and want feedback on your files, or you want to ask questions one-on-one, -on -one, I offer consulting for that through my Grotzer Graphics business. Go to grotzergraphics.com slash InDesign dash accessibility. And that's G as in George, R, A, T as in Tom, Z as in Zebra, E, R, graphics.com slash InDesign dash accessibility. If you need help making InDesign files accessible as a service, we provide that as well. You can get in touch by going to the same URL, grotzergraphics.com slash InDesign dash accessibility. Yeah. <laughs>